Great Depression and the New Deal, the long and short of it, big idea is that the Great Depression is an economic crisis that lasts roughly 10 years. Now, different history books will tell you different things. Like some people will say it lasted all the way up until like 1942. I tend to like World War II because, to be honest with you, World War II, more than any single event, is the thing that puts people back to work and gets us out of the Depression. The New Deal is simply the government's programs to try to help people during the Depression. And next Monday, we'll spend some time actually doing something illegal in most classrooms. We'll have a very nice scholarly debate about that. I'll give you some information, and you're going to have to make your choice about did the New Deal help people, or was it totally ineffective and worthless? Well, I don't know if it was totally worthless, but I can tell you this. It did quite a bit more than what government has ever done before. When you think of the Depression, you think of things like this. This photograph right here is a very famous photograph. You've got, you have a migrant worker here from <coughs> Oklahoma trying to find a job because of the Dust Bowl. And her face says it all. And, and the children are dirty and she's like, where's my next meal going to come from? You see people in soup lines and soup kitchens trying to find food, even though they are people who have had good jobs before, but the depression has totally sucked the air out of their lives and it's just, ugh, they need to survive. You, you think about strikes, violence, in, in the Great Depression years, in like about 1937, there was like something like over 4,600 strikes in a, in a year. It, it almost felt in some ways like America was coming apart as the more economically desperate everything got. You think of the great charismatic guy Franklin D. Roosevelt there, who is the president of which our friend up here speaks. Um, tremendous charisma, tremendous will, four terms elected, the only president to have that happen, dying in office in 1944. Anyways, we'll get into this starting now. Now just a little bit of essential questions. One of the things I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit is the cause of the Great Depression. It's Hoover's fault. No. It has to do with other stuff that's going on. And there's a lot of debate about this. We still don't know, almost 80 years later, exactly. Well, like Economists can guess. I'll give you my take on it. It's probably not going to be that different than what your book says. But the cause of the Depression. The second thing is, what was the response of the government? How did the responses of, say, Herbert Hoover differ and compare and contrast with Franklin D. Roosevelt's? Because it's like night and day. Laissez-faire versus activism. You know, Republican versus Democrat. And really, this is the beginning of the way that Republicans and Democrats deal with the economy today. Republicans and Democrats take their cues about economic policy from the 1930s. No joke. Third question is a more evaluative question. Were the responses by the government adequate in solving the problems of the Depression? Were they good enough? Did the depression, um, be, was, it, was it affected in the positive way by the things that the government did? Or did the government provide more harm than good in some cases? We will get into that. Were certain ethnic groups changed um, as a result of the Great Depression or hurt or helped more than other groups? You know, those are, those are huge questions. And then here, you know, you get into some debates about, hey, if you're liberal, you think that the government didn't do enough. If you're conservative, you think the government did way too much. So, I mean, like, it's, it, when you look at it from that angle, from whatever angle you're looking at it from, you can make a lot of cases for whatever case you want to make. My favorite question is this one. 
how are we changed by the Great Depression and the New Deal? What, what are the scars of the Depression? How did that affect the way that we are in 2015? What kinds of policies are still around that affect us today? Right? Now, there's a lot of policies that the government made back in the New Deal time which still affect us today. Stuff like Social Security. Your grandparents, if they're 65 or over, they should have access to Social Security. Unless you're like LeBron James or something and you make tons of money. Then you ain't going to get no Social Security. But for most of us, Social Security is something that will be there when we retire. That's all started during the Great Depression. If you have a bank account, how many of you all have bank accounts? How many of you bank with my bank, EECU? Okay. Yeah? How many of you bank with, like, Bank of America? I'm sorry. How many of you guys bank with other banks? Cool. Guess what? Thanks to the New Deal, all of your bank deposits will be 100% there for you if your bank goes out of business. You won't lose a single penny because the U.S. government insures it. But back in the Great Depression, if your bank failed, <laughs> yeah, you just lost everything. You've been saving for 40 years to save thousands of dollars. And all of a sudden, you go to the bank and it's out of business because of the Great Depression. And Oh man, the bank teller says, sorry, <laughs> we're out of business. Where's my money? Sorry, we're out of business. <laughs> Where's my money? You don't understand. No, seriously, dude, we're out of business. It's never going to happen to you or me. Economics. I enjoyed economics in college. You probably hate it. Anyways, in economics, you have ups and downs. The language of economics is, is sometimes complicated. You've got peaks where the economy is doing well, like kind of like right now in America. We're at kind of a peak. Um, our it, when you're in a peak, unemployment's low. People are working and wages are, in some cases, going up. Now, if you go off of that, and over time economies do this, you go through a recession. A recession is a slowdown in the economy. That means unemployment is up. That means production is down. That means that more and more people are out of work, which is unemployment. And if it gets really bad, you have what's called a trough or a depression. But over time, if left alone, economies will always go up and they'll always go down. And what you want to do is you want to be a president who's president when the economy is going up. Because then you can take credit for it, even though you probably had nothing to do with it. Think about Herbert Hoover. Poor guy. He's in office and all of a sudden it's like a bomb went off, you know. It's like, what do you do? So anyways, peaks, valleys, shoots, ladders. You know what I'm saying. So we know that the 1920s was a tremendous time of growth. Tremendously good. But was it good enough? What was going on under the surface? If we scratch beneath the stock market, the roaring 20s, if you look at that graph right there, you see what's called the Dow Jones average. The Dow Jones average is, the, is, a, is a, how best to explain it, the higher the number, the better the stock market's doing. Back in the 1920s, it was doing really well. It was on the up. The up and up. It was almost at 390. Oh, whoa. Do you know what the Dow Jones average is today in 2015? We're at 18,200. The value of the stock market has increased like, I don't even know, because I don't teach math. But it's a lot more. 
okay? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's out of control. But during the 20s, the 20s is a great time, but you can see once the stock market crashes on Black Tuesday, October 29th, 1929, the stock market goes into a bottom and it bottoms out by 1932. And the stock market is always a good indicator of how the economy is doing. One of the first things I do on my phone every day is I have this cool app. It's called Bloomberg. You're like, Mr. Berg, what the heck is that? It basically tells you how the stock market is doing. And if we have an upward trend in the stock market, like if it's up, that's good because my investments are, gonna, are doing well. And also it means investors are happy with the economy. It's doing well. Now, depending on who you ask, this says 1942. But it, you know, could really be 1939, 40, 41. But we have the stock market crashing. Now, the stock market crashing, most Americans associate, like if you ask a lot of people, they'll say, well, that, you know, that's what caused the Great Depression. Yeah. That's totally what caused it. Um, yeah. And then you ask them, well, why did the stock market crash? Well, I, 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 I don't know. And that's just what happened. You know, people crash. Stuff crashes. You know, things happen. Okay. You must not have taken a history class. Okay. So, how does this happen? How do stocks, markets, and markets crash? How do they go? Because if, if you look at any day in the United States, every single day on your phone or whatever, you will find that the stock market goes through ups and downs throughout the day. Now, if it loses like 300 points, that's a crash. If it gains 300 points, you're like, oh, that's awesome, that's a rally. If it loses like 10 points or 40 points, eh, don't worry about it. But why did the stock market crash? What was going on? Let's talk about what was going on. Does anybody know, though, before we begin? Stocks are a little confusing, it's okay. Mr. Bird is here to be an investment service for you. Okay, here's a little stock primer for you. When you guys, if you guys want to make money, there's three ways to do it. You can do it illegally, which of course means selling stuff that's illegal. Or Lord knows what else you might do with yourself. Watch an episode of Breaking Bad or something like that. You can figure that out. The second way is to just re work really hard to try to get promoted so that you have more money. Right? And the third way is to invest in the stock market, which is kind of like legalized gambling. Let me explain more. When you, uh, if you want to make money, here's what you do. Uh, you look online and you try to find, okay, what company is doing really well right now? And you might say, well, Apple's doing really well. So you type in Apple. And you can see that Apple's... You know, a, a dollar value pops up, say 300. You're like, well, 300. That's the value of what's called a share. So $300 a share. Companies sell shares of their companies to investors like you and me, just normal people, in the hopes that you will buy shares of their company so that they can make more money, so that they can expand their business, right? And so that they can hire more people, create more jobs, Blah, 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 blah. When that happens, that's a good thing for them. For you, what you want to do is you want to buy that one stock for 300 and you want to wait until Apple does real well, selling a whole bunch more iPhones or eyeglasses or whatever the heck they're making now. Or is that Google? I don't know. Whatever it is. You wait until the value of that stock goes up and then you're like, oh, cool, now it's worth 400. So here's what you do. You're like, well, I bought it for 300 and now it's worth 400 So what am I going to do? I'm going to sell that thing and get $100 back. Yes, I just made 100 bucks. Yeah. That's what people do every single day in the stock market. It's totally legal. It's not a big deal. But back in the day, in the 1920s and 30s, <laughs> the scandalous stuff was 
happening.